கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா Namaste and welcome to the third episode of this Bhakti Bhava series. And today we're going to talk about the types of Uttama Bhakti, the levels of realization and the types of sadhakas. Now I wanted to mention for those who may be wondering, why are we going into all this stuff? Well, I wanted to do a series on Ramana Maharshi's devotional writing, his poetry, especially his poetry about Arunachala. And when I took a look at it, I said, wow, this is so deep. This is so advanced that who can understand it? So I felt a need to give the background, the science of bhakti, and especially the emotions, bhava and rasa, the transcendental ecstatic emotions that one experiences in bhakti. And this also has a, a very special place in my heart because I came up through the bhakti system. I was a bhakti sadhaka for over 30 years and then I became a Buddhist monk for five years. That was my Raja Yoga period. And then I was still looking for something. I still didn't feel complete and I discovered Ramana Maharshi. His teaching made me feel complete. Now many people stress, or I should say even obsess over Ramana's teaching of Advaita. And that's okay if you're ready to realize Advaita. Then you should be focusing on it, concentrating on it. But what about after you realize Advaita, what next? If you remain attached to non-duality, then you're still in duality. Why is that? Because <laughs> you're thinking, I am an Advaitin. I am only into Advaita, non-dualistic thinking. And so you have the, the really absurd spectacle of these people claiming to be Advaitins, but they still are engaged in activities. They're going here and there, giving talks, doing classes and all this stuff, but they have no background to explain it, what they're doing. What they're doing is bhakti, ananya bhakti. But because they have only studied Advaita and they have not studied Bhakti, they have no idea what they're doing and they can't explain or justify themselves. They can't even explain why they look both ways before crossing the street. <laughs> I mean, if you're a total Advaita, it doesn't matter if you get hit or not, right? Come on. So if we are moving in duality, if we are functioning in the world, then at that point in time, we are in duality. Come on, admit it. It's okay. <laughs> Somebody asked me the other day, yesterday actually, why do I spend so much time making videos and trying to help others 
Don't I realize that there is no others? Huh? Aren't I fully realized a Dwayton in those words? Well, yeah, I am. And I do understand and realize on the level of a Dwayton, non-duality, there is no other. There is no I either. There is only the self. Pure consciousness without an object. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> and when I sit in meditation, I go into that world and that's my existence. Or actually even the word existence is not proper. That's my being. But when I'm working in the world, when I'm functioning in this body, I'm in duality. So how do I explain my existence and activities in that sense while still remaining connected to the truth? Instead of using the language of illusion as a default, I choose to use the language of bhakti, which recognizes duality as the phenomena arising from the self. And as Ramana said so many times, when you recognize phenomena as the self, it's no longer duality for you. And because the self is the most beloved object of everyone, Therefore, bhakti, really ananya bhakti, uh, non-dual bhakti, is the state of mind of a realized person who is operating in the world. That's why we're going into this. Uh, and also <laughs> to provide a background for explaining the Bhagawan's uh, devotional poetry. That's coming up. But this series and the previous series, Ananya Bhakti, and the next series, <laughs> Bhakti Rasa, are all to give the background, the preliminary information, so that we can even talk about Bhagwan's devotional poetry. Otherwise, if we try to use conventional language to explain it, there's so much we're going to miss. So I'm giving the background in all detail first, and then we'll talk about the substance. So now in this video, I'd like to talk about the types of Uttama Bhakti. Sa Bhakti Sadhana Bhaktir Bhava bhakti prema bhakti riti trividha. Sadhana bhakti punarvaidi raganuga bhedena trividha. Uttama bhakti is of three types sadhana bhakti, bhava bhakti, and prema bhakti. Sadhana bhakti is further divided into two, namely vaidhi bhakti and Raganuga Bhakti. So in this series, we're going to talk about all these different types of bhakti. Usually when people talk about bhakti, they only talk about sadhana bhakti, and they only talk about vaidhi bhakti. But vaidhi bhakti is the lowest. Huh? Why is it the lowest? Because it's rules and regulations. And how can you legislate love? It's not possible. Real love is spontaneous. Just like the difference between marriage and having a girlfriend or boyfriend. The love is more intense when it's not formalized. As soon as one becomes married, if you've ever been through this in your life, you know. As soon as marriage happens, something happens to the quality of the love. It becomes formalized. It becomes socialized. It becomes legalized. My God, <laughs> how can you legalize love? 
It's ridiculous. The whole concept is absurd, laughable. So real love is always spontaneous in the moment, arising out of nothing but the spontaneous attraction of the lover and the beloved. So in this video, we're going to talk about sadhana bhakti. And of course, sadhana is performed by a sadhaka. So who is a sadhaka? The Vedas say, utpanna rataya samyam nair vigyam anupagata atma sakshat kritao yogya Sadaka parikirtita. One in whose heart bhava toward the self has already manifested, who has become qualified to perceive the direct manifestation of the Lord, but who has not yet obtained complete freedom from all obstacles, is called a sadaka bhakta. So this is for the person who is working their way through the yoga system, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, jnana yoga. They are not yet fully realized. Once someone becomes fully realized, they may still be a bhakta, but they're not a sadhaka. <laughs> they're not practicing sadhana bhakti. They're practicing prema bhakti. And so we have to also discuss the different types of bhakti. So first we're going to talk about sadhana bhakti, because that's the easiest to understand. So what is sadhana bhakti? Kriti sadhya bhavet sadhya bhava sa sadhana vidha nitya sadhyasya bhavasya prakatyam hridi sadhyata that bhakti which is accomplished through the function of the senses and by which bhava bhakti is obtained is called sadhana bhakti. The realization of nitya siddha bhava within the heart is called sadhyata, attainment. In other words, sadhana bhakti is the type of bhakti which is performed to get bhava. Bhava, as we discussed in a previous episode, is ecstatic transcendental emotion. Now, you can't just mock that up. In other words, you can't just pretend to have transcendental emotion. It comes as a result of performing bhakti. What kind of bhakti? Sadhana bhakti. So if a person is observed to have transcendental ecstatic emotions, it means they have performed sadhana in the past. So what is the sadhana? It is defined in terms of its result. Sadhana is that which brings about these transcendental emotions. So in other words, if a person is executing what they think is bhakti, but it does not result in spontaneous transcendental ecstasy or bhava, that's not the real bhakti. And that's why most of the people who practice sadhana bhakti according to rules, vaidhi bhakti, don't get the realization. Because as I said, Real love cannot be legislated by rules and regulations. So, if a person remains stuck on the platform of rules, huh, it's just like a musician. In the beginning of music, you have to practice scales. Well, but if that's all you ever practice, if you get stuck at the stage of practicing scales and arpeggios and stuff, you never become a real musician. Why? Because a real musician is expressing emotion through art. 
That's what real art is. It's not that the emotion comes from the practice of the art. No, the art comes from the expression of the emotion. So a person who has this bhava and is expressing it by means of bhakti activities is the real bhakta, not one who is simply practicing rules and regulations. A person who is trying to attain this bhava bhakti and prema bhakti goes through nine stages. So let me explain those stages briefly so that you can recognize them when you're in them yourself. The first stage is by hearing the transcendental shastra, that is the scriptures. Shuddha shraddha, pure faith appears. Shraddha means firm belief in the meaning of the bhakti shastras. But that firm belief must not be dogmatic. If it is, then it's not shuddha shraddha. Shuddha means pure, in the mode of goodness. But if one is practicing bhakti to obtain some result, that is not shuddha. That is not pure. That's not of the mode of goodness. That's in the mode of passion. So in other words, one should not practice bhakti with any other aim or desire than bhakti itself. That is shuddha. That is pure. That is the mode of goodness. Stage two. Upon gaining shraddha, one obtains sadhu sangha and in their company receives instructions regarding bhajana, sadhana, and worship. So in other words, as soon as you have the faith that bhakti is going to bring me to the stage of realization, then you are qualified to associate with sadhus, people who have that realization or at least are working very seriously towards it. And by associating with sadhus, you get to hear the instructions from the scriptures. It's one thing to read something in a book. It's another thing to hear about it from someone who has realized it. That's why these videos are valuable. They add meaning to the scriptures by showing life experience based on bhakti. Ananya Bhakti, of course. The next stage. Thereafter, one takes up Bhajana Kriya, the practice of sadhana, beginning with Sri Guru Padashraya and so on. Sri Guru Padashraya means taking shelter of the lotus feet of a guru. Now, this is the absolutely first beginning stage of bhakti or of any sadhana. Without accepting instructions from a guru, either directly, which is the first class, or by hearing others repeat it, which is second class, or by reading it in a book or some other medium, which is third class, then how are you even going to know about the existence of these things? unless you stumble across it by some extraordinary accident. But that simply means it's part of your prarabdha karma, and you had cultivated it in a previous life, and now you're getting it back due to the eternal nature of these realizations, the transcendental nature of real spirituality. So the next stage is, by constant engagement in bhajana, Anartas gradually disappear. Anartha nivriti. Anartha means a disfavor, a, a misfortune. Huh? Artha means fortune. Artha means actually wealth. So one can cultivate material wealth, which is temporary and miserable, <laughs> because it always goes away. 
Or one can cultivate spiritual wealth, which is permanent, eternal, and blissful. Because once one establishes this wealth, the spiritual realization, it never leaves you. It cannot be taken away by anything. It's permanent. So this is the real wealth, artha. Anartha means that which diminishes your spiritual wealth by covering it over with unfavorable uh, ideas, activities, and speech. If one does something or thinks something or says something of an unfavorable attitude toward the Supreme, this is an anartha. And what it does is it diminishes one's realization and standing on the path. So by constant practice of Bhagavat Bhajan, one reduces these anarthas. How is that? Because if you're trying to perform bhajan all the time, if you run into anarthas, that will stop your performance. And it's very noticeable if you're really on the path. So in that way, it diminishes the anarthas, leading to pure uh, practice of bhakti. The next stage. As he becomes freed from anarthas, he attains nishta, determination, and freedom from all distractions, vikshepa. At that stage arises one-pointedness, ekagrita, incessant striving in bhajan. In other words, bhajan is all that's important. Nothing else matters. At this stage, one has attained complete renunciation, uh, someone was asking me today about renunciation. Renunciation doesn't mean giving up objects. Huh? It means giving up attachment to them. Certainly one requires certain paraphernalia and, and uh, facilities for performing bhajan. But if one is performing bhajan with sincere faith, then there is no concept of I, and so there is no concept of mine. This is giving up all attachment. This is complete freedom from possessiveness and egoism. So in that stage of mind, there is no possessiveness, so there is no attachment. So this is renunciation. This is the actual renunciation. The next stage is Thereafter, ruchi, taste, or intense hankering for bhajan develops. If you have a taste for something, huh? like people have a taste for food, if you really like to eat, <laughs> then you will love to cook. <laughs> so in the same way, if you have a taste for bhajan, then you have to have it not only three times a day, but all day, all night. All you're being engaged in is bhajan, by your very nature. So this is a very advanced stage on the path, I shouldn't have to tell you. One who has this ruchi enjoys bhakti and his seva, his service, so much that we say he has a taste for it. And next... When ruchi becomes very deep, it is called asakti, spontaneous determination. Nishta, ordinary determination, involves application of the intelligence, whereas asakti is spontaneous. In asakti, he no longer depends on reasoning by intelligence. He is deeply immersed in the performance of spontaneous bhajan. In other words, the bhajan is just happening. I remember one time I went on a long retreat of chanting the holy name. At that time I was chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. But this applies to any form of bhajan. If you engage in bhajan as much as possible, I was chanting a minimum of eight to 10 hours a day. 
there comes a stage where the chanting or other bhajan seems to go on spontaneously without any effort on your part. This is nishta, very wonderful stage. Asakti. Next, after asakti, bhava makes its appearance. So, this series is about bhava. That doesn't mean that there is no bhava in the previous stages. But what it means is that bhava becomes thick, condensed, and strong. Uh, that's when the ecstatic symptoms appear. So the example is cooking milk. When you first start to cook milk, it's kind of watery. It's very liquid. It sloshes around the pot. Uh, but as you cook milk, if you've never done this, you should try it just to have the experience. It goes through several stages of progressive thickening. And after a while, you have to turn down the heat so it doesn't stick to the bottom of the pan. And after even longer time, you have to stir it constantly with a flat spoon. Uh, there's a certain kind of spoon which is cut off on the end for keeping the milk from sticking to the bottom of the pan. So in the same way, bhava, or ecstatic transcendental emotion, starts out very dilute and thin. But as one progresses through the stages of bhakti, it becomes thicker and thicker until it's just always there. Uh, so this is the stage of bhava. This is the uh, penultimate stage of bhakti. And in the final stage, prema manifests. Prema is bhava bhakti which melts the heart much more so than in its initial stage, which greatly augments the feeling of transcendental bliss and which bestows a deep sense of mamata, possessiveness in relation to the self. Possessiveness, this is something, see these different stages are just unknown in Western theology. Uh, mamata means one thinks, God is mine. Huh? We have the, the flip expression, oh my God. Huh? But when one really realizes this stage of mamata, this thick prema, huh? one thinks, God is mine. <laughs> and on the flip side, I am God. Uh, but these are not simply intellectual concepts. They are not cheap. They are earned by years of intense sadhana. And when one realizes them, in fact, not just as an intellectual statement, then one's being undergoes a terrific transformation. And this is the stage of prema. Prema is the highest stage of love of God. So, as one goes through these stages, one goes through also the stages of the different types of sadhakas, different types of devotees. I'll go through these real quick, and this is the end. The Kanishta Adhikari Bhakta still has traces of desire, basana, and impressions, sangskara, of the material mode of goodness. He's trying to be a good person, <laughs> but he still has some identification with being a good person. He still thinks, I am a sadhu, I am a devotee. He has some ego about it, he has some attachment to it. And because of that, his bhakti is not pure. His bhakti is still on the platform of rules and regulations because he's still making a distinction between being a devotee and a non-devotee. So the next stage, 
Madhyamadhikari Bhakta, although still residing within the gross material body made of five elements, he has no vasana or samskara within their hearts. See, in that way, one no longer makes a distinction between someone who's devotee and non-devotee. He no longer makes a distinction between a sadhu and a sadhu. He no longer thinks, I am a devotee, I am a bhakta, I am a sadhika. Huh? He has no more ego, in other words, because why? No more vasanas, no more desires for material things. But he still has not realized prema. He still has not realized the highest. For that, he has to attain self-realization first. So who are those devotees? The Uttama Adhikari Bhakta. They have merged completely into the self or created a perfected spiritual form as a pastime associate of a Purusha avatar. Now, these are all very high, high states. Uh, really, in our time, only a few people have attained this state. Certainly, Ramana Maharshi. And I believe uh, my guru, uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami, my Adi guru, had attained something like this state, very high state. And one in this state has complete realization of everything in the scriptures. That doesn't mean he necessarily teaches on that level. Uh, therefore, Bhaktivedanta Swami was teaching very, very beginning stage bhakti in duality, dualistic consciousness, although he had certainly realized something far beyond that. Ramana, on the other hand, was teaching the highest stage of Advaita. But when he wrote poetry, he wrote it on the stage of Prema Bhakti. This is very difficult to understand, and that's why we're going through all these explanations of the different stages and the terminology of bhakti. Not that this is for everyone to realize, but to understand these categories so that when we encounter them in the literature, or if we're very fortunate, in our actual life, we can recognize and appreciate them for what they are. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinalgum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam